It's open. It's open. Yeah. That's right. So we're about an hour into this, and we are officially into the iPhone. Officially into the phone. Officially into the phone. Every year, a new iPhone is released. And every year, repair-focused companies race against each other to be the first to crack it open. The teardown has become an annual competition for street cred, with small teams flying around the world to be the first to get their hands on the new phone. After a few years of pestering iFixit, the most famous teardown team, they finally let me hop on a plane to Australia to go behind the scenes of their iPhone X teardown. We are driving up the Pacific Coast Highway right now to meet with Kyle Weens and the iFixit team. Uh, we're going to hop on a plane later tonight and fly to Australia and hopefully become the first team to tear down the iPhone 10. Kyle. Welcome hi. to iFixit. Thank you. This is the headquarters of the global repair movement. So is this a storefront? We don't, we don't, we're not open to the public. This is just office, warehouse. We believe that everyone should be able to repair their own stuff. So we don't attempt to fix things for people. We hook them up with people in the community that can. Yeah. iFixit is a free open source repair manual. And our goal is to teach everybody how to fix all their stuff, whether it's an iPhone or a blender. We fund the staff by selling parts and tools. The parts and tools are part of the solution. And if you need them, we've got a good option. Teardowns are, are, are a fun exploration, their journey into understanding and learning how something works. We're constantly taking things apart, posting it online, teaching people how to open their own things and repair them. And some companies have this planned obsolescence mentality and their business model is built around selling you shit that's gonna break soon. And we're disrupting that model as best as we possibly can. Today's Halloween, so. <laughs> It's going to be a little bit strange. There are professional engineers in costume. This is our you know, the nervous system of iFixit. We have our community and content team, folks who are actually writing the repair manuals, live over here. And then the software team that builds the website is, is over on this side. I started uh, in, in the dorms. I was trying to fix my laptop, and it was harder than I thought it needed to be uh, because there was no service manual on the internet. And I thought, this was crazy. How is there no repair information online? I know what the service manual looks like, and I can't have it. And it turns out that the reason was that Apple had sent takedown notices to everybody that had posted the service manual online. So they were using copyright to prevent people from knowing how to fix their stuff. And that seemed absolutely ridiculous. And uh, so we decided to go ahead and uh, take the laptop apart again, write a repair manual, just kind of out of frustration and spite and damn you, you're not gonna, you're not gonna prevent me from knowing how to fix my thing, I'm gonna share it. And it got unexpectedly popular. This is just like the library of parts. Anything from like um, maybe a volume button on the side or power button um, to like a battery connector or an earpiece. Literally, you could probably build a phone out of these parts if you really wanted to. NES zapper. <laughs> there you go. So this is a kit for repairing the PlayStation 3 yellow light of death. It's very good. Right. So that was a that was a manufacturing defect. Same thing with the Xbox Red Ring of Death. That made us a lot of money because <laughs> <laughs> because the manufacturers screwed up. Usually it's 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 batteries and glass are the most yeah. common things across all devices. While Kyle prepares to go to Australia, Sam, I fix its lead engineer is staying in California to oversee the teardown from iFixit's home base. I'm in charge of the tech writing department, so we do all the repair guides and the teardowns that most of the internet knows us for. Who cares about the teardown? Like, is it just people who are super into gadgets? We have such a wide audience for these. It's always, like, really incredible. Um, yeah, we get a ton of people from uh, chip manufacturers who, like, want to have their uh, chips shown because they're under an NDA and they can't say it themselves. But as soon as we publish a photo of it, then they can be like, oh, look, like prospective buyers, like we're in the new iPhone. Yeah, really what we want to do is just like show people it's not like the monolith. It's not just like this sealed black box. Like you open it up and there's a battery, just like in your car, just like in your watch, just like in anything else. You guys do teardowns here. Why are we going to Australia for this teardown <laughs> when it, you have a perfectly about, good studio right here. It's all about the time zone. Uh, the, the phone comes out at 8 a.m. and that's just sooner in Australia. So we go wherever we, we can to get it first. Go to the phone. I mean, the internet is so real time. It's just such a challenge to be uh, at the forefront of the story. And 
Uh, if you're if you're 12 hours behind, it's over. Yeah. So this is one side of Pacific, and now it's time to go to the other. It's 6 a.m. We flew halfway around the world. We're now in Sydney, Australia, and we're on the way to the Apple Store to hopefully be one of the first teams to buy and tear down an iPhone 10. Tell me that this is not a ridiculous thing that we're doing right now. <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous thing that we're doing right now. <laughs> I don't think there's any defense. I mean, the, the, it's a big gamble, right? Because if the devices ship early, that's it. Right now, we have a phone reserved at 9.30 a.m. pickup. Okay. Uh, so we'll get a phone at 9.30. 75% chance we'll be able to bump things up from 9.30 to 8. There are situations people wait in line, they say, well, we thought we were gonna get 10 phones, but we only got five, and so we know we gave you a reservation, but you're not gonna get it. So at that point, you have to turn to the five people that got it and start offering them stacks of cash. How much cash did you bring? <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the bank today. I'll probably pull out um, a few thousand in Australian, and we'll see. People waiting in line and, and you know, they're like, what are you going to do with the phone? I'm going to take it apart. Well, are you going to use it first? No, not even <laughs> going to turn it on. We tried to film inside the Apple Store, but weren't allowed to bring cameras inside the mall. All right, we got the phone. We got the phone. Show them the phone. Get it! We'll put the phone on the dash. I mean, everybody, uh, the Apple folks are all so excited. So yeah. excited. Are you excited? I am excited to get going on the teardown. I'm not yeah. excited that there's a new phone in the world. <laughs> vroom, vroom. Uh, our 9.30 pre-order, they were willing to let us in and get our phone right at 8, which was great. And we were the second person in line. I think you got it first, though. I think we probably got out of the store before anybody else, yeah. Going to CircuitWise, which is the second largest electronics manufacturer in Australia. And it's the best place to tear down an iPhone. Yes, it is. <laughs> we, we've done quite a few uh, tear downs here. Awesome. We're going to have to put little coats on. Okay, that's yeah. excellent. That's. Yeah. The first uh, electronics factory I've been to. Really? Oh, really? Lucky for iFixit, CircuitWise is right around the corner from the Apple Store. It's also the perfect place to tear down tech, thanks to specialized equipment such as x-ray machines and micro-soldering stations that help the team see into the guts of the phone. a reasonably satisfying experience. Come on, boots. You're okay, in. I have a phone, all right. So we've set the vibrator on inside the machine so that we can capture a video of the Taptic engine vibrating. Because there's no way, you take apart the Taptic engine, you can't really see how it works. It's, it's, it's a vibrator inside. All right, we're good? Okay, so you'll work on getting the photos up. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, sorry for that delay, here you go. What are we doing? We're taking apart the phone now, I think. In California, they're wondering what the hell we're doing. Had the phone for an hour. Yeah, look at that. Look how long that is. It's been unchanged since the 4S, really, when they introduced it. And uh, for some reason, the, the screw is about three times longer than normal. And it doesn't have threads. So you can see how long that screw is. There might be another screw to the outside of those, like inside the structure. So they might be inside somehow. Historically, the only things that were anywhere close to the precision of what you see in, a, in an iPhone were in something like a Swiss watch. Uh, and it's incredible uh, precision engineering, but it's, it's in uh, production volume on the scale of hundreds or maybe thousands a year. Okay, so how's this coming apart? It's kind of just like it's the eight? It's a very similar procedure to the eight, a little bit of heat to soften the adhesive strip around the display, and then a little bit of suction to lift it, just open up a slight yeah. crack, and then you can <laughs> slice the um, Does it feel the like the adhesive. same amount of tension as the eight? It's actually, I think it might be easier. I just accidentally turned it on. This is not. You guys didn't remap the power button, did you? It won't turn off. The Siri is mapped to that button, so you have to like hold it down longer. That's always there's always an emergency. Like, hey, the phone turned on. Ever since the original iPhone, you know, devices used to have an off button. It's done. It's open. It's open. Yeah. That's right. 
So we're about an hour into this and we are officially into the officially iPhone. Officially into the phone. Officially into the phone. Um, we had trouble with the phone turning on and off while we were taking it apart, but uh, from but that, that was really the only smooth sailing. We took our time because we didn't want to damage it in case there was something different, but there really wasn't. The battery is massive and it takes up much more of the space of the interior of this thing than ever before. So we're wondering how did they pack in a new infrared projector and get two hours longer battery life on the iPhone 8. So the logic board is much smaller? Yes. Like, how did they do that? So Just much smaller chips, much... Billions and billions of dollars. It's a new manufacturing process. Um, it's called a stacked SLP process. Basically, I think what that boils down to is the traces are smaller, everything is denser, and it may be, uh, it may have some additional layers. In any individual chip, Okay. If you look at it, you think it's it's just a postage stamp and there's just one layer inside. It's not. Maybe the original iPhone there was there were some some rough edges around it, but now it's it's so incredibly polished. I mean, it's the most thought out, design carefully designed product in the history of the world. There, I don't think there's any single artifact that has ever been made that has had as much thought and intent and intent that's gone into it. Uh, and it's not just the folks at Apple. I mean, you have folks at Qualcomm that have put in thousands of years of effort into designing just one chip. This is a significant design change, right? Like this is, when they say Shrinking that Shrinking the is, board, yeah, yeah, this is a big deal. I, and it, I mean, this is not quite at the level that the Apple Watch is, but with the Apple Watch, they brought everything onto one chip. We've got the iPhone circuit board out, and it's incredibly dense. It's kind of like actually the original iPhone circuit board where they were layered, two boards layered on top of each other. So we have to desolder them. And that's tricky and, and it's almost more of an art. Uh, this particular phone is not gonna go back together. So yeah. the phone is dead. Wow, it's just like a cake, not a cake, yeah. but it's, a, it's extra thick. We are 10 hours into the teardown and it's pretty much done. Actually opening the iPhone doesn't take all that long, but the team has to meticulously photograph every step of the process to document it for the teardown. This is the shell, right? Everything else. Uh, it gets laid out in here. Uh, so we're gonna do our layout shot, we're gonna pack up, we're gonna head back to California, and then we will put it back together, and then we'll take it apart again and use the phone to write the repair manual for them. Was this a successful trip to Australia? It's been very successful. I mean, we, we gotta post the teardown and see what people think, but uh, I'm, I'm really enthusiastic. Our team has done a fantastic job. Increasingly, we're being locked out of our things. Uh, software is eating the world. We're adding microchips into everything that we own. And so in order to have a ownership, uh, in order to understand what ownership means in the 21st century, we're gonna have to deal with electronics. We're gonna have to deal with these complex systems. And as we've seen the opposition to right to repair legislation come from so many different industries, it's not just the cell phone manufacturers, it's the tractor companies, it's the car manufacturers, it's the medical device manufacturers, it's the scientific equipment companies. The industry gets bigger and there's more and more money in the internet of things, that means there's more and more money lobbying to prevent these kind of laws. In order to fix something, you have to believe in yourself that you can do it, you have to know how to do it, and then you need the tools and the parts.